Uh, hi everyone. Uh, hello, welcome all. This is Nidhi from Design Hill, your host for the day. I hope you and your family are keeping well and safe. Uh, and I would like to welcome you again in this session where we are discussing all about money. I mean, we are, we are discussing how to build a, robo a robust sales funnel to turn leads into customers effectively. Uh, today's event is brought to you by Design Hill, world's leading creative marketplace that caters to the creative needs of businesses and individuals alike who can source high quality designs from professional designers and buy unique products created by independent artists. So moving ahead, let, let me introduce our uh, guests for the day. Uh, we have with us uh, Marcus Kochi to start with. Uh, Marcus, Marcus has got uh, 30 years of experience in sales and recruitment, 17 years with standard training covering SME, mid-market and enterprise, direct and channel sales. He has served clients across uh, 500 plus segments of the market and helped them generate a dollar 6.5 billion sales. He's known for his honest, direct, uncompromising dire direction and advice. Marcus offers fractional CRO services to fast growth, technology scale ups, and is also the co author of Making Channel Sales Work. Marcus, just say a quick hi to the audiences. Hello, Marcus Kathy. <laughs> nice to meet you. That, that's pretty quick. Next, we have Sangram Vajray. Uh, Sangram, ran, uh, Sangram ran marketing at Padot, uh, which is now acquired by Exact Target. And then Exact Target was acquired by sales for $2.7 billion. Soon after, Sangram co founded Terminus, which, which hit a dollar, uh, $1 million in the first year, $5 in the second, and $15 in the third year, ranking 21st in Deloitte's fastest growing company named back to back as one of the best places to work. Sangram is also the co-author of two books on marketing, a frequent keynote speaker, a host of the top 50 business podcast called Flip My Funnel with over a half million downloads. He has also been named as one of the top 21 B2B influencers in, world, uh, in the world uh, by the DMN network. Sangram. My goodness, well, I mean, there, there's nothing more excruciating than hearing your own bio uh, in front of you. Uh, thank you for doing that. Appreciate it. Good to see everybody. Thank you so much, Sangram. Up next, we have Jason Bay. Jason uh, is an outbound sales coach and a trainer for B2B reps and sales teams and helps them master the skills and techniques to, uh, techniques to confidently land meetings with their ideal clients. He has done everything from selling house painting, services door to door, running outbound call centers to teaching hundreds of reps the art and science of cold outreach. I think that's a very humble start off. And, and uh, Jason, just say, uh, say a quick hi to the audience. Uh, what's up? Yeah, I'm, ex I'm excited to be here. Uh, yeah, this is awesome. It's this, this is a cool group to get to collaborate with. Very equally excited. Thank you so much. Last but not the least, we have Michael Hansen with us. He is the co-founder of Growth Genie, a consultancy empowering B2B teams to have better conversation and build repeatable, scalable sales processes. Before starting Growth Genie, he was the VP growth for CloudTask, helping the company scale from eight people working in the CEO's apartment to over 200 full-time employees. Michael. Great to be here. I think, as uh, Jason said, we got a really great panel, so uh, I think it's going to be a fun session. Yes, it will be. All right, so uh, that was uh, about our speakers. Uh, before we start the session, guys, uh, let's quickly look at what Design Hill is all about. Looking to get your Looking boss to, to your remember boss your name? To remember head to the world's head number one creative number marketplace, one creative marketplace, Design Hill. Design my company promoted, my company promoted me to head up our latest, latest real estate development, development project. project. I was excited, I was excited. Then, anxious. then anxious, and petrified. Then How was I going to I hire, the team, hire the team, get the designs completed, the designs and design beautiful and presentation materials on our budget while impressing my bosses, some of whom are still learning my name? Good job, Mitch. My name's Lawrence. That's why I went to Design Hill and got the design help I needed that fit within my company's brand guidelines. The process was simple. Design Hill's design contest ensured I'd get a ton of results I'd love. Start by picking a number of designs that inspire you. This one's good, and that one. This one speaks to me. Then share some information about the project. Lastly, pick a package that fits your budget. Do you just want a logo or do you want it all? Then, boom. I got more than 60 custom design options to choose from, as well as all the other graphic design assets I wanted. And it's all backed by Design Hill's 100% money back guarantee. If I don't find a design I like, I get my money back. 
you can't lose. Now I have what I need to make a splash of my meetings. With everything from business cards, pamphlets, posters, and more, it's real. Let the world know it's real and build your brand with Design Hill. All right, that was about all about Design Hill, and now we are all set to start the session. To all the sales professionals watching me, uh, watching this, guys, you are making a lot of money in this event today, so all eyes here. We will also take up questions during the session, so if you have any, please drop them in the questions tab on your screen, not on the chat, but on questions tab, uh, so that it doesn't get lost in the chat. So uh, uh, I'm going to start with a very basic question, and it is, this is for everyone. Uh, since the the topic is about you know building a robust sales funnel, let's talk a bit about the must-haves of building a robust sales funnel. And I'm going to start with you, Marcus. Got got to unmute yourself. One second. There we go. Uh, I'm too stupid to earn most of the technology I have. Um, so the the first rule is identify who your customer is and who they're not. Um, so much time is wasted on prospecting for people who you're comfortable calling but can't buy. They can only say no or maybe. Um, and make sure you're clear about what your ideal customer profile looks like and concentrate all of your energy and effort on making sure you target them. Deliver incredible value. Don't just show up and vomit lots of information about your product, your company. Um, don't and under no circumstances put a PowerPoint up that has your headquarters on it. Um, make sure that what you're doing is timely, it's relevant, you've done your research. And contrary to a lot of people's thinking, I don't believe that sales is a numbers game. I think certainly at the uh, higher end of the market, what you should be doing is making fewer higher quality calls. And that therefore means you have to do your research. And you need to target the right job functions. You need to make sure that you get the coverage that you need. In most organizations, there's between three and seven influencers. Um, so if you only have one point of contact, you don't really have a prospect. Um, so I'll let everyone else chime in at this stage. Great. I agree that understanding your user persona is very important, and so is research. Uh, Sangram, you want to add to it? Uh, add to it, I'm sure. <laughs> I think we all we we all could, um, but but definitely echo what you're saying, Marcus. Um, I, I think I think a lot of people forget that we're marketing to people, and copywriting is something that's super underrated for for marketers. Um, in a lot of ways, when I when I see what they're they're really marketing, and especially if you're B two B, if you're in B two B, just say yes or no. If you're in B two B or B two C on the chat, so we get to know that. Uh, but if you're in B two B, you got to know who your customers are or future customers are. Um, and you notice I'm not using the word prospect for a reason, because when you say prospect, let me ask you this: How many of you like to be prospected? Probably none. How many of you like to be hunted or whaled out of water? Um, like, you know, every typical sales jargon that I hear, the reality is we don't treat a lot of our people that we want to be our customers with respect. So if you start thinking about and ask this question a lot of times, like, hey, would you send the same type of email to your customers? Uh, no, 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 we won't send that email. We will send an email to a customer once a month, maybe once every, once when there is something really, really important. But how many times do you send an email to your future customers, the, the ideal customers, as Marcus said, um, every day? And if they never opened up, we'll send them another one, just in case they forgot the first 21 emails we send them. So the idea is that we, we forget the very important notion is that there are people. So I would say the number one thing is that as you figure out who you're targeting, also figure out your voice, also figure out your customer's pain points. And if you know the pain point and you start talking about the problem, not the product that you're selling, but the problem you're trying to solve for them, uh, I think you'll get a better response. Absolutely, absolutely. You definitely have to see the pain point and then address it likewise. Right. So, Jason, uh, your take on that, please? Yeah, I mean, I always look at things through an outbound lens. So I think the most underrated part of the sales funnel, because there's so much focus on outbound, is people don't look at how to make them work together. 
And my belief is that if you don't have a good inbound engine, the outbound engine is really, really hard. So if you don't have good content, um, so for me, the, the big requirement and must have is conversation starters for your sales team. And it needs to be, just to echo what those other two said, um, it needs to address problems and it needs to do it in a very specific way and give people education that they might not be aware of. So it either needs to talk about a problem they might have that they don't know about that you could educate them on, or it could talk about a problem that they willingly talk about in an open public setting and like have a different perspective, like have some sort of perspective on it. Uh, a company called Gong.io, I mean, they do a, a, just an awesome job of that, right? Like um, I was listening to their CMO on a podcast and he talked about outbound is where they get most of their business. It's because their content is so freaking good, right? They can put the content out in front of people and it's fixing, uh, it's helping people fix problems that they, that they know that they have. So for me, I just come back to conversation starters, you know, empathy and having tools that your salespeople can use and really great content that they, they can put in front of the people that they're prospecting to so that those people actually want to start a conversation about something that's important to them. Absolutely. It, it, uh, I'm very happy whenever anyone uh, mentions empathy in their discussion because I think that's, that's the need of the hour as well. Um, so, um, Michael, uh, last but not the least, we would like to have your thoughts as well. Uh, what, what do you think are the must have of building a robust sales funnel? Yeah, sure. I think I'll, I'll build on a couple of points that, that were already mentioned. So Jason was just talking about content, which is funny because I'm like Jason, so I'm more from the outbound world, but I also see the, the value of, of content and, and inbound marketing. And I think if you're talking about a funnel, you've got to make sure that you've got content for every stage of the funnel. Because I think what happens is sometimes people have very good content for the top of the funnel, but not for the bottom of the funnel. And, and a piece of advice that I give and I've been talking about recently is I think as you go down the funnel, your content can get longer and longer form. So like when you're doing outbound at the top of the funnel, have extremely short content, have like little snippet videos. If you if you follow me on LinkedIn or like I've seen Jason, a lot of you, we're not sharing like 20 minute videos on LinkedIn. We're sharing like one or two minute videos because we know people scroll through their, their feed and, and that's what they get. But I think once you've built rapport with someone, once someone subscribes to your newsletter, once they're a customer, then you can share, you know, a long podcast or longer form content. So I think start with shorter content at the top of the funnel. And as you go down the funnel and as you've built more rapport and more respect with your customers, have longer content. And then the other thing that I wanted to build on, Marcus makes a great point, and I see this all the time with the customers that we work with, is that people prospect, people who aren't their ideal customer profile, and it seems so basic that you would think, oh yeah, focus on your ideal customer profile, focus on the people that you can help. But there's still massive companies I know that are going after the wrong customers. And a really good bit of advice I would give for that is align with customer success and talk to them about who are the customers that get the most value out of our products because they're on the front line with them every day and then target those people and also interview your customers, the ones who you've had most success with, interview them, say, what do you like about the product? And that's and what were the pains that it's solving as we discussed that's the main thing what does it help you do how does it help you in your day-to-day -day? and then that's the content that marketing should be making all around that and those are the people that sales should be targeting i think there are a couple of points that really need to be emphasized here and um, the one of the biggest mistakes i see and why funnels fall apart they tend to look like a, an old pair of granny knickers they're wide at the top wide at the bottom and baggy at the bottom uh, and what they should look like is a thong. Uh, they need to have a funnel shape. Uh, and the part of the reason for that is salespeople and marketers are reluctant to take people out. Um, I think uh, a really robust disqualification process is key. That frees up resource for the next critical point, which is concentrate your energy on the middle of the funnel. Everyone talks to you about, you know, keep prospecting. Uh, and then as soon as you put an opportunity into the CRM, the next question that pops out is when, when is the predicted close date? And so your attention goes from the top to the bottom and the middle of the funnel is missed. And this is really where uh, content nurturing and really good account-based marketing uh, can come into its own. Uh, you need to nurture the middle of the funnel and you need to create engagement. And I touched on it right at the beginning, which is coverage. On average, most sellers will get one to two points of contact of, of, of influence within an account. Uh, we know from research 
that even for a company of uh, 200 people, uh, the average is about 3.43 influencers. When you get up to um, over a thousand people, there are at least six to seven influencers. Now there could be a buying committee made up of power, uh, sub decision makers, influencers, recommenders, specifiers, technical buyers, user buyers, and financial buyers. And if you are not getting that coverage, all you're doing is just making noise. So those are really critical points to build on. Absolutely. We do have a full-fledged question on that as to how you nurture the middle of the funnel. So we will take it up, uh, uh, you know, uh, that, you know, uh, that, you know, bombarding people, I mean, bombarding um, uh, your funnel at the awareness stage with a lot of content might have a larger dropout rate. And that's something that we at Designer also, you know, we learn uh, that uh, that you know how how important it is to know and analyze that at what point a user would want to drop out. Uh, given we are bombarding them with a lot of content, content is important, but then we also have to optimize it in a way that you know it doesn't. Uh, the user should not be spamming our mail. I mean, it, sh it should not land in the spam folders. That's that's all what it is all about. Right. So um, <clears throat> the next question uh, is the most asked question, actually. Our registrants have asked this the most number of times. Uh, and it is very, very obvious as well. Uh, so we all know how COVID has changed the entire landscape for all the businesses. We no longer go out for coffees and lunches to warm up leads. So has it really affected the conversion part of the sales funnel? Also, does COVID necessarily mean that the sales conversion cycle will be a long one and and for every business uh jason i'm going to start with you no dude that's such a big question uh <laughs> so, <laughs> where, where do i start um i think that depending on the industry i think right now it's really easy to play a lot of mental gymnastics and really psych ourselves out about a lot of things especially i'm, I'm always thinking about from an outbound perspective so like what's the morale on the on the floor, right? On the people out there starting the conversations. And I think the most important thing that you could do if you haven't is like really meet with as many of your customers as possible and get them on group calls and small group calls is what I'm suggesting and seeing a lot of success with is like, how can you help uh, your customers help each other? And in doing that, what tends to happen is you have people you know, if you work with marketing departments, for example, and you can get VPs of marketing and CMOs to get on a small call with other peers, uh, they tend to help each other with things that because you're not a CMO that you don't really pick up on and little nuances and it becomes an insight that you can share with people. Um, so I think like having something to share is very, very important right now. I've seen that just a huge trend of that because that has changed. But the framework with the work that I do with Outbound has not changed. Um, you kind of have to double down on, so I look at it, identify, engage, convert. So the identification, the ICPs and personas, you may have needed to shift to industries less impacted. Um, the engage part, um, you still need solid problem-centric messaging that focuses on them. That's always been a thing that's worked well. And some of those things that you put in the messaging, like their problems might have changed since then, right? And the convert piece, getting the meeting I mean, needing to handle objections and like do all that, and that part hasn't really changed. Like what you plug into that framework has changed. Um, so I don't know if that answers you. Like it was a really big question. <laughs> so I think I hit on a very small piece of that question, but those are my thoughts. Yeah. And, thank you, and thank you so much. Maybe I can yeah. just inject theirs. Yes, I was coming to you only, yes, yes. <laughs> well, and, and, and I hope uh, everybody can just jump in so that you don't have to go through each one of us. And <laughs> Yes, yes, please feel free. Um, it, I think I'll just share something that just recently started working that we never really focused on. So maybe an idea for others to pick up on that. So I'll love to hear how many of you folks do webinars. Like this is a great format that you and the team is putting together. Um, and you know, just, just to hear how many people are actually doing that, uh, just type it in the chat. We started to recognize that the bigger draw events were not driving revenue as much as we uh, initially used to think like and especially when COVID hit to your point specifically you know everybody's gone virtual everybody got virtual events and now now the the real challenge becomes is that worth my time because I'm already zoomed out 
So let's just take that one example, webinars. If that is a strategy that you have, what we have seen work recently is instead of having a 100, 200, 1,000 people virtual events or summits that we used to do all the time, we started to create 20 people events. And we'll cap it out at 20 and say, they're only we're only inviting manufacturing CMOs and marketers in this group to talk about how they're dealing with this issue and how we as a company can help them uh, maybe solve or address any of their account based challenges that are driving. And we didn't even mention Terminus, we didn't even mention ABM actually at that point. And we would only have one or two questions lined up for them. What we saw was one, we will get about 80, 90 percent attendance which I don't know how many of you ever have seen that. I've not seen that uh, since yes. my part of the day. The challenge always, yes, yes, absolutely. Right? So 80, 90% attendance rate, people would stay, it's like typically 45 minutes, they will stay for an hour and a half because they're having a peer-to-peer -peer conversation about their industry. It's like a therapy session at the end of it, you know, when you're, when you're. So what changed for us was instead of going full on big event, we like we started to do literally every other week we would do sometimes manufacturing whichever industry you want to go after insurance or stuff we'll invite only three of two or three of the people and tell the other people in the same industry so we stopped doing blast to everybody saying come to our webinar it was more of like we'll selectively say hey we're only doing it for you folks so hopefully you show up so that just changed the game and the impact of it the business outcome has been tremendously good so right now i feel the power is in relevancy of like how relevant your content can be as opposed to content itself. Absolutely. And these are really insightful things for us as a team as well, because we do events on a large level and uh, to 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 a to, you know, target the right TG as well as, you know, uh, tie in that relevancy factor. It's better to, uh, you know, target 100 people and get 80 out of it rather than targeting 1000 people and only getting you know, uh, 50, 40, and 70. I mean, you know, it's all about the relevancy as well as, uh, so yeah, these are really nice tips. And uh, Michael, uh, you have been uh, quiet for some time now, so we would like to have your take on this. Yeah, sure. Um, I think what's happened this year is that, I mean, Sangram just mentioned this about the, the relevancy part, but people are talking about how you have to personalize, and <laughs> be more empathetic and, I don't know what people were doing before because that's what you should have been doing before the, the pandemic. And that's what was so funny is there was all this content around that. And I was just like, this is the same content that should have, you know, people should have been publishing always. And I think, um, obviously, I know Sangram's an expert in, in account-based marketing. And I think everything's becoming a lot more account-based. So there's a lot of debate uh, in my world about should you split inbound and outbound? So whether that's your account executives all your SDRs. And I think what we're moving towards is less an inbound and an outbound model. And Jason was talking about this as well, and more an account based model. So everyone in a sales team has a list of accounts that they go after. And it's a bit like Sangram was saying, you have a, an event with, uh, you know, 100 people, and you know, everyone intimately at that event, and you're building relationships, intimate relationships with companies. And I think it's become more important, because as the, the question says, you can't meet someone for a coffee, you can't go for lunch. And I'm a big believer in, you know, Zoom and, and virtual, but you can never beat face to face. But now that we're all on this level playing field that we're all virtual, it's like you need to try and be personal, even from home. So the way to do that is by being extremely personalized, extremely relevant, and having an account based approach, right? So making messaging that's specifically for that account, rather than having a, a spray and pray approach. And you may get a click of an email, but you may be able to go and see that person at an event. It's become a little bit harder, but as long as you're using the same tactics as before and they were good and it was about personalization and relevance, then you know you can still win. Great, thank you so much. Yes, Marcus has something um, to say. I, I do. I, I think there's an awful lot of guff spoken about face-to-face -face and road warriors um, I think uh, have, have had their egos pricked. The reality is you should be able to sell whatever the medium. And yes, you lose some of the um, uh, non-verbal uh, communication, but uh, actually uh, selling virtually has a number of massive virtues. 
Um, the first one is that in this day and age, you can just simply say, um, so Michael, um, th would you mind if I record this call so that I don't have to take notes and I can concentrate? Now, that means that I can run it through a uh, gong, chorus, or refract, and I can do conversational analytics, and every single call uh, is a teachable moment. Um, I think the other problem is that um, a lot of salespeople, if we're being perfectly honest, and I'm going to be brutal here uh, because it's not in my nature not to, are not salespeople. They are order takers. They're empty suits with commission breath. And um, what they spend their lives doing is showing up, throwing up, quoting and hoping, and selling and running. And that is not what selling is about. Uh, selling is a noble profession. Um, and what COVID, uh, like Michael said, COVID shouldn't have sh uh, shifted your behavior uh, to be more customer centric. It shouldn't have focused on um, uh, the uh, uh, shift to be more empathetic. You should have that anyway. Uh, I, I interviewed Dr. Laura Janicek, uh, and she said, listening is the transfer of meaning. And we need to be better listeners. I have never listened my way out of a sale. I've talked my way out of plenty. Um, we need to be prepared. And what COVID is really is a fabulous crisis, and you should never waste a good one. Um, if you can't serve and help a prospect or a customer to um, uh, make that point, um, you shouldn't be selling to them. If you can help them, you have a moral obligation to sell to them. And I think what happened when COVID struck was an awful lot of people got squeamish about the idea of prospecting. You should have been on the phones even more than you were before. Uh, you should have really uh, put your mental radar up in terms of how can I help? How can I think creatively around their problem? What else is happening? What are the risks these people are trying to mitigate? But most people didn't. They either uh, bolted back into their um, uh, off the phone uh, and started resorting to tedious email. Um, or um, they, uh, when they did speak to people, they were almost apologetic about doing so. Uh, what's changed is if it's important, then the buying cycles have accelerated. If it's not important, they've been involved. So you have to find a way of being relevant and important now. If you're not doing that, you have no business being uh, wasting their time because most of these guys are trying to survive and they're thinking about cutting heads. They're worried about keeping their job, paying their mortgage. Um, so don't waste their time. Talk. Yes, I think it's, it's, it's tough advice, but it's equally important how you convert crisis into an opportunity. Yes. Uh, all right, I've all right. seen my clients uh, increase their pipeline 300% during COVID. Uh, I've not one of my clients I was working with pre COVID is below 140% of quota. Uh, the average range is 140 to 220%. I have two clients who are 3000 and 5000% up on last year. So again, it's down to what's going on between your ears. Recession is a mental condition. I hope everyone, I mean, our attendees are taking a note of all these golden words. <laughs> I want to go prospect now, man. <laughs> <laughs> you got me fired up, dude. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So I'm quickly moving on to my next question. And I'm going to start with Sangram. Uh, we, before this webinar started, uh, I was talking about this particular thing that a fat funnel doesn't ensure and buy the best fitted accounts for their businesses and uh, maybe discard the rest. I'm not sure if I'm using the word discard. It is it the, if it is it the uh, right word. Um, so how does one identify the best fitted accounts for their businesses and when is the right time to stop pers uh, pursuing the prospects on ground? Well, uh, I think as soon as you realize that uh, that if you're in b2b it's a finite market it's not an infinite market like uh, like you know you might if you're unless you're selling a nike shoe then you're going after any and everybody i think as soon as we start realizing that it is not about the total addressable market tam which is really talked about a lot but it's actually trm which is a total relevant market uh, going back to the point of relevancy i think everything changes uh, people start realizing that uh, they can't just send random conversations, emails, posts to the same people because they may not, not have another chance. 
Um, Jay Bear and I were on a on a podcast, and he he said something that really rings true to this. And this is to answer the question like when should we stop? It's like every touch point, every single touch point that you have with your customer or future customer, either you're building a brand or really crushing it in a negative way where they have a negative feeling about your brand. There is no neutral, like never, there's never an email that comes through where I just feel like, oh, I didn't feel anything. I always feel something. I hope everybody feels something when they get it. Either it's like, oh, that's a waste of time. Oh, that was a bad sales process. Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do business with them. These are all things going on in your mind about every single touch point. And we just don't think enough, long enough to, to see that, well, that can actually have a negative impact on my personal brand, as well as the brand of my company that somebody has to now overcome the next time somebody reaches out with a lot more empathy to that. So I, I feel recognizing that the pool is smaller, not too large, will give people the opportunity to think about, I need to take great care of these people and I need to create relationships with these people. That means I need to know these people. That means I need to engage with these people these conversations will start happening in your mind and then the content and the copy that Jay is talking about, Mike, uh, you know, Michael is talking about, all these things will hopefully start happening because you don't have an unlimited pool. Right now, when I look at a lot of the sales outreach that happens, there's, it's, it's like, hey, it's, I know it's a canned email and a canned thing and it's just like, okay, I'm not giving you anything because you don't even know. If you took like two minutes to look at my LinkedIn, you would know more than what you just put in that uh, put in that message. So to me, the, the way to, to one is know that lim there's a limited pool. The world is not over there, like all over it. And then number two is that you're either building your brand or really making a negative feeling for your customers and future customers about your brand. And you have to choose now how you're going to go about it. Great, Sangram. Thank you so much for your uh, words. Uh, Michael, Michael, I'm going to ask you this again. Um, so uh, I'm actually I'm gonna turn the question a little uh, around and uh, uh, Sangram uh, threw enough light on how you know uh, to you know to identify the best fitted accounts. So do you think uh, you know the 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 uh, leads which get discarded and we do not pursue them anymore? Uh, how can is there any way we can make anything of them? I mean maybe for the second time or how do you think we should go about it? I, th I think as Marcus said, you've got to focus on only the people that can buy from you, right? So it, it's, it's much better to, and you said the example earlier, like to have, you know, a hundred people who are super engaged and a thousand people who don't care, care about you and you're just, you're just spamming. I mean, you, we essentially talk about, you know, sales cadences. So you've got a, a number of touch points that you need with certain relevant messaging that's going to turn someone into a sales opportunity and then to a closed deal there may be some people who aren't a right there may be a timing issue right timing is often an objection for something else but sometimes there is a genuine objection for timing such as that they just signed a contract with a competitor right and they got a year year agreement so then it's, you know, a year later, you're going to contact them and then you put them in some kind of nurturing funnel, right? So you put them in a newsletter, et cetera, whatever it is. But the more relevant you can make your content, again, if you've got a newsletter, but you've got different types of industries or different types of buyers that you sell to, separate that newsletter, segregate. And one of the things I'm seeing, I do actually still believe in some form of automation, which is controversial to some people because some people say everything has to be personalized when it comes to outbound sales but automation works when you segregate your data well right so you say this is x persona this is x industry i know they have these pains so you segregate your list a lot so you may have like 20 30 lists and you're segregating by that and by by triggers so a company that's using a software a company that's hiring a particular position that's when automation works well but when automation doesn't work well, as you've got a list of 3,000 people and you send the same message to all those 3,000 people, that's when automation works badly. So automation can work well when you've actually automated, but it actually makes it seem personalized. All right. All right. Great. So, um, Jason, the next question is actually for you. I'm going to start with you. And it is uh, also uh, one of the most asked questions, again, in our registrants list. Um, and we're going to do a three pointer thing in this. I mean, this question, everyone can add like three, three things, uh, you know, they think is relevant to this question. 
so the question is that it is assumed that a prospect is the most delicate at the interest stage once you know um, they have learned enough about the product or service and they are on the verge of taking their decision so what are some key pointers to ensure that it converts without a fail um, jason a uh, quick three pointers <laughs> Man, you're giving me the loaded yeah, question. Yeah, you're getting the best. <laughs> all right, all right. So, so we'll not make the <laughs> Just, just go ahead. Um, so I guess uh, <laughs> interest stage. Um, I don't know if we're talking about the maybe the you know the the uh, you know buyer's journey here or or what you mean by interested. I don't know if this is. You know, so I'll just go through the context of someone was interested enough to take an introductory call with us to see if it's a good fit to sort of get the sales process going. All right, so I, um, I, I, I'm sorry. So I'll quickly uh, okay. uh, you know, reiterate the question for you. So what I mean by interest stage is that, you know, uh, so someone uh, who you approached has, uh, you have uh, given them a lot of uh, content to read and they know enough about your product. And they know that awareness stage has gone. That, you know, that stage where you actually make them aware about your product and services. And then the next is interest stage, where a little interest yeah. has started creating and you know uh, the the next two stages are all about taking a decision and converting so what 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 is that you know the sales professional should take care of when the uh, prospect has uh, you know entered the interest stage has shown interest and on the verge of taking a decision so so that stage we are talking about okay i mean there's just so much uh, there's so much there uh, so i'll just go i'll just give a kind of an example i guess so when you say interest stage, I'm going to assume that what that means is this person is going to hop on a call with me. They've agreed to that call. They're opting into the experience, and I get to actually talk to them for the first time. So I'm just going to look at it through that uh, more of like a discovery lens. So I think what's really important where I see companies making big, big mistakes, and uh, Sangram talks about this a lot, is like we're not thinking from the customer's perspective when we do discovery. We're not helping them discover anything. It's really about us making sure, hey, do you have budget? Is there a buying window? Uh, when's your contract up on the current product that you're using? Um, are you the decision maker? Like we're, we're approaching it from a very sales oriented way versus what the buyer might need to get the conversation started. So there's a lot of context that's needed for like who you're talking about, um, who you're talking to at the company, what their role might be. But if I had to outline like two or three big things that you really need to accomplish when you're doing that discovery, is like you need to figure out uh, like what is the prospect's top like two or three priorities. It's a very underrated thing that I don't think people just simply ask. Uh, hey, Sangram. Hey, I know I talk to a lot of CMOS and they tell me that they're focused on this, but just for you, just so I make sure to talk about something that's relevant for you, and we can spend our time on something that's productive. What are the top two or three things that you are most focused on in your role? And where I find people going astray is they think that as a salesperson, I can come in and reprioritize the prospects. Uh, list of priorities. I can move my thing up to the top of the list, and it just doesn't work that way. When you're talking to an executive, you got to align with something that is already a priority for them. Ninety plus percent of cases, that's that's the way to do it. Uh, that's the the approach that we see working the best. So, what are those priorities? And then you got to figure out and like really come in knowing what are typical problems that get in the way of them accomplishing that. And there's two questions that I love asking. I got this from David Premer over at Cerebral Selling. And this usually puts an executive into like emotional thinking mode versus like wanting to know about your product and the price and wanting to see a demo. Uh, so the two questions that I learned from David that I've started using in the last couple of months that have really helped is, hey, you know, if there's like one thing you guys could do better when it comes to like going outbound and breaking into new accounts, like what do you think it would be? And most of the time when I ask that, people are like, oh, huh. Uh, I don't know. I guess I'd want people to pick up the phone more. You know, they say all kinds of different stuff, and they're giving you their emotion, their opinion on something. And then the other one would be, well, hey, and just out of curiosity, like, how would you rate if you had to on a scale of one to ten, like how good your team is at doing that right now? And you're getting them to actually give you things that you can talk about versus you saying, you know what, you have this problem. I don't know if you know that you have it, but you have it because I talk to other people in the industry that have the same problem, and no person is going to be open to that type of approach, in my experience. It's really getting them to open up a little bit more about what their opinions are and how they're doing things and looking for something that you can you know, latch onto. So those are the things that I would say are really important to do from a discovery standpoint um, in your first interaction or two with a prospect. And that's exactly what we wanted to know and understand as well. So thank you so much. 
uh, and Marcus and Sangrab have really interesting things to say. I can see in chat. Ma uh, Marcus just mentioned that interest interest stage is usually the kiss of death. So Marcus, yeah. please throw some light on this. Right. And the, the problem a prospect brings you is almost never the real problem. And the people who say, oh, that's interesting, or, oh, yeah, I'm interested, are generally politely trying to get you off the phone. Um, send me something is the kiss of death. Uh, bad salespeople think that's a, a buying signal. It's not. Uh, it's a polite way of telling you to go to hell. Um, and uh, But they don't want to say it to your face. Um, and 80% of the average salesperson's career Get this, okay, if you are an employer, 80% of your average salesperson's time is spent chasing people they should have closed or disqualified on the last call. If you can eliminate that one full step, that's a 400% increase in production capability, okay? Uh, if you are a salesperson, you should be ruthless, uh, brutal in anything that wastes your time. So when someone says to you, yeah, uh, give me a call back in a couple of weeks, send me something or send me a proposal, send me a quote. Uh, what you should be responding with is, Jason, do you mind if I ask you a cheeky question? Is, is that sure. a polite way of getting me off the phone? Because you really have no interest, but you're trying to spare my feelings. Uh, because I want to know, no, an early qualified no is a win. It's like saving a goal in football. You win on goal difference. And uh, part of the problem is that salespeople who don't have a strong uh, pipeline uh, are desperate to keep everything in there so they get their mortgage paid for one more month and they don't get fired. Um, what we should be doing, and this is where the problem really lies in most businesses, what we should be doing is training them properly, coaching them properly, having genuine accountability. I remember sitting through, uh, I was observing a sales meeting uh, with a potential client and um, the sales rep said, I know this is the 10th month that this deal has slipped, but they're really interested and I'm sure they're going to buy this month. Um, and the sales manager put it back into forecast. What passes for average in sales is bad. What passes for average in sales management is horrific. Um, if you've ever calculated the cost of a bad hire, in enterprise sales, it's 35 to 125 times salary. If you have a bad manager managing a team of bad enterprise salespeople, you can multiply that number by five to tenfold. And if you're running a channel, you could easily move the decimal point, one point to the right. So the, the real issue is, are we asking the right questions? Are we looking at the right end of the problem? Because salespeople generally avoid prospecting because of psychological issues. It's not down to competency. Uh, it's down to fear of rejection, fear of interrupting, not wanting to be disliked, all that kind of garbage. So have you recruited the right people? My favorite question, Sangam, you'll appreciate this one. Uh, when you've got a bad salesperson, uh, my question to you at that point is, did you hire them that way or did you make them that way? Because the reality is, whoever hired them is responsible for their behavior. Now, I think most, of the pe most people on this call are looking for magic dust. And I think what's better is to look at the right end of the problem. Look at what the cause of those problems uh, is um, and look upstream. What is it that we did or didn't do? What is it we said or didn't say? So, you know, qualifying for BANT, I think, is a criminal act. Um, that, that delivers zero value to the customer. As far as they're concerned, it's just a, a crappy uh, questions interrupting their day. And Jason got was on the money, so I will shut up after this point. Um, a great question is, Jason, let's pretend it's 12 months from today. What exactly do we need to have delivered? Assuming we end up working together, what is it we need to have delivered at, by that point at our renewal conversation for you to say, thank God, best decision we ever made was bringing you in? And they'll tell you exactly how to sell to you. That's how, you that's how you generate a desire. It's not just interest. You've got to drive that desire. Yeah, well, I think Marcus can give us a full-on motivational talk. Uh, we should always have Marcus for the, the hype, hype music before any sales call. Listen to a recording from Marcus, and you will do a better call. Let's just call it the hype. You can't motivate anyone to do anything, but that's another conversation. <laughs> hype man for us. Uh, but it, it, it does bring me to, uh, to think about, like, well, 
maybe I'm the only marketer um, um, on this, though. so I'll, I'll provide a different perspective on this. Well, how can a salesperson be more effective in these scenarios? And the thing in many ways, marketing is uh, in many ways underutilized by the sales team. Absolutely. Right, marketing things like they create a ton of content. 80, I think there are stats that say the 80% of the content that marketing creates is never used by sales. Well, the reason is, is a lot of times sales is giving them this abstract information of what they want, or marketing will just come up with something they want to create. Uh, but if you really want to use marketing to to drive your business and and marketing gets paid well, so they you, they need to be doing. And I've said this before, um, in the, even in my book, is marketing's job is to either incrementally or exponentially grow sales. If that's not what your marketing team is doing, then there's a big problem with that marketing. So they should be in, in your hub of what you need to do. So in our company, and when I talk to other uh, CMOs, we talk about this, this one thing that every good salesperson does. And that is they literally would go to marketing and say, here are my top 10 accounts that I need to close this year in order to hit my quota. And when they list out the top 10 accounts and say, show me ways that you as a marketing team can help me engage the number of people that some of us we know, like 10, eight, eight, 10 people in it. Show me ways you can help me engage with these 10 accounts. Chances are, if you have a smart marketing team, they will do things and figure out a way to do that. But that's how you figure out, is that gonna help me or just give, give me air cover for accounts that I don't even care to sell? That is one question that very few salespeople ask. And every time they do, they actually get good response and results from it. At a minimum, you would know you have a good marketing team or not. But if they can help you with that, you're actually going to exceed your quota. Sangam, one point that I'd really like to make, um, and I'm bouncing it back to marketing, because I think the lack of alignment and collaboration between sales and marketing is criminal. And yep. sales is a subset of marketing. Uh, so let me start with that. Um, but why is it so few, few marketers speak to customers? That I think is an absolute crime. Oh yeah, I mean, ultimately I've, I've said this before, like marketing needs to be compensated just like sales in a way where they actually have either may not be quota per deal like a salesperson, but there there gotta be a bonus structure set up for marketing. Absolutely. And because the KPIs and metrics are not aligned, they're just two different goals. That is the only, like fundamental challenge that I still don't understand when I talk to see is like, why are we having a different goal for marketing than sales? And as soon as any company says, you know what, marketing, you're gonna get a big fat bonus at the end of the quarter, right? Not do, don't do yearly, actually do it every quarter. That That's another big lesson I learned, like yearly is too long, it's too, too different. Do it every quarter, every quarter when we hit so-and-so numbers, that goes across the entire revenue, top line and expansion and cross sell, all of that you actually make a bonus. I don't understand why CEOs and, and, and leaders don't actually force that. And if you're a good marketer, you will force that because you'll actually make a lot more money, but no, you have to go to a different company. But the reason they don't talk to customers is because there is the, the lack of incentives, the lack of, lack of pressure that marketers face of like, hey, go create product marketing stuff, go create a case study, go create an ebook, go create a webinar. They're just tactical. And it really starts at the top. I think it's a, it's a communication issue more than anything. And I think for, there's the, the age old debate, right? Uh, sales says marketing leads are rubbish and marketing says sales aren't closing any of their leads, but often there's not detail that's put into it. So if you're a salesperson, you're like, marketing leads are rubbish. Don't just say that, tell them why. Like, why are the leads rubbish? Are they not qualified? Are they not the right size companies? Is it not the, the right persona? And also if you're like, create a bit of content, don't do it at a high level, we tell a story, right? So this week I was speaking to a customer and he basically had these pains. And if we had a, a blog or a case study around that, it would have really helped tell a story for this. So it's really important that. And then on the other side, if you're in marketing, speak to your sales team every week and say, what are the takeaways you had from your calls? Because if you've got account executives or salespeople, they're having like 20 demos of your product, they're on the front line with customers, so they're gonna know what the pains are, they're gonna know what they need to have, what content they need for, for, for selling. So it's just, a, it's really a communication issue is what I've seen at different organizations. Michael, do you really think it's a communication issue? Or I, I would challenge um, on that, like I think it's more of a KPI, like measure, like 
not measuring the same success thing. The communication is their issue, is, is an issue overall, but without the right alignment on what success looks like, the communication is all over the place. Now, once you know and agree on what the success looks like, and then still there's communication issues, so I'm with you on that, but I, yeah. I wonder if you think where you rate that. Well, I think it's, it's a given analogy, right? This is just sales now, right? Sales management with the sales team, like Marcus was talking about. You can just look at the KPIs, like the productivity, number of calls, number of LinkedIn messages, number of emails. You can also look at qualified meetings and uh, pipeline closed deals. But until you actually listen to calls and speak with your sales team and coach them, you're not actually going to know where the real issues are. And I think it's the same between marketing and sales is often they're just not aligned and they sales doesn't understand the content marketing and producing and marketing is raking the wrong content because they're not understanding who the customers are that sales speak to. I think this is a cultural uh, issue um, and it starts with leadership. Um, more often than not, what you're getting is um, a disconnect and Sangram's right. Uh, what you measure happens, what you don't doesn't. Um, but way too often uh, there is this cultural uh, chasm uh, between sales and marketing. And what we should do is start with the customer. Uh, everything that we do starts with and ends with the customer. They're at the heart of everything that we do. We exist because of them, not in spite of them. And what we shouldn't be doing is fighting each other. We should be spending our time listening to, speaking to the customer, getting their feedback, learning what it is that they're doing. I, I interviewed Chris Dannon. Uh, who is uh, was uh, Zig Ziglar's bag carrier for 30 years. And he made a really vital point. When you prospect, you should be prospecting for five years in the future. Not today, not to hit this month's quota, but five years down the line. When you're looking at future customers, you should be looking at getting lifetime cust or customers for life. And you should be thinking five years down the road. And that's where that's the starting point of all of this that goes wrong. Uh, it's we're too transactional. Um, more often than not, uh, in tech, certainly companies that are being driven by private equity and VC are driven to stupid behaviors and horrific management practices. And it's a horrific place for an SDR to be. Jason, your thoughts? Uh, I I kind of I think it's a communication issue as well. I, with the companies I work with, yeah, I'm not working with the sales forces of the world. I'm not working with these big enterprise companies. I work with a lot of mid market. You know, companies. Me too. And the companies that I work with, they have no communication. And a lot of times, what I'll do is I'll say, hey, if we got marketing, product, and sales, let's just get a couple people from each team and get six people on a call. And marketing, what did you learn about what copy worked best in the ads this week or in this month? Uh, sales development, what did you guys learn about what subject lines had the highest open rates? And just that, the start of the collaboration, I think like you can get a groundswell effect going where you can have the KPI conversation. I just like the KPI conversation is like with the companies I work with in my experience, it's just, it's such a hard place to start because so much has to change in that company's culture when there are people on the sales and marketing teams right now that can start working together and helping each other. So that's that's my angle on it. I, I'm trying to look for the path of least resistance. You know, now, those, let's, those let's, marketers can help the sales development folks. Let's just get them talking right now and, and see how they can collaborate and help. And like, anytime we do that, the prospecting always gets better when we do Well, let, let me just share one, one idea, Jason, that, that mm -hmm. I've just seen work tremendously that, that allows this communication to happen without necessarily having a call that is forced. One thing that we did starting last, uh, probably it's been 24 months now, every month, we would bring a customer in the office now on Zoom for the entire company, for the entire company, and we'll do an all hands with them. And the part of that conversation really is one to get to know them, not how they use our product, uh, which automatically comes in that conversation, but it's just to get to know them as a person. So the person in the payroll department who is sending them invoices to the person who is creating features when they talk about things that actually make up that promoted to the person who's actually marketing and selling, they all hear from like, what would Julie do? Would become the conversation for the next meeting in the marketing team because Julie yeah. came in as a customer and she shared that she likes this and she hates this and she drinks wine and she um, she loves to watch these type of movies. And, and when they she sees an alert coming from sales inside in Terminus, that makes her day, boom. 
you got a feeling that now everybody for the next almost three, four weeks can use that as a question every time they're stuck. What would Julie do? Yeah. What would Julie want? And that that one thing, that one strategy, I think was our best marketing strategy that we created. Not not to the world, but internal enablement of knowing how our customers are and what drives them has changed the way we think about them and the words we use them because we everybody heard those words. It wasn't a marketing campaign. It was the words from Julie. So uh, just as an example to fix the communication, like, well, this is what we are all about, Julie. That, I freaking love that, man. It's so practical and like there's so much mileage that you can get out of that exercise to help with stuff. That's, I'm gonna steal that one. <laughs> all right, all right. Oh, yeah. I will, I will. Great. <laughs> I was so absorbed uh, in uh, your discussion that I almost forgot to play the mid role. And I think that's a very good sign of how exciting and interesting the session is. So, uh, uh, so skipping the mid role, I am going to actually uh, jump onto the next question straight away. Uh, Sangram has already actually covered uh, a lot of part of uh, you know brand marketing and uh, you know how marketing teams are actually. Uh, you know, they were ma how marketing and sales team actually work in cohesion, right? So uh, he has already covered all of that. So I'm gonna uh, straight away, uh, uh, you know, jump onto the channel sales question. It was again, uh, you know, almost like uh, five to ten attend, uh, att uh, five to ten registrant asked this question about channel sales, and we also have a channel sales expert with us, uh, who's Marcus. So um, uh, there are a lot of challenges associated with channel sales, Marcus, uh, when you are not. Delivering your product to the end customer directly, it sure raises the scope for a lot of loopholes, which may eventually lead to miscommunication and put obstacles in providing uh, product and services. So, uh, simply, uh, what can we, what can a business do to avoid this? How, namely, how to, uh, you know, choose a better cha a channel partner or distribution mechanism. So, yeah, uh, my question is for Marcus. Right. Okay. First of all, um, do not treat your partners like a get out of sales free card. Um, I wrote this book, Making Channel Sales Work, precisely because we saw uh, so much awful uh, behavior in the channel. The channel is not um, a free uh, sales resource. Uh, it's not the ginger haired, illegitimate, ugly stepdaughter of direct sales. Um, it's your fastest route to uh, hyper growth and international expansion if you do it right. Um, so the first thing is, and make sure you look in the mirror first. Are you a good partner? Are you set up to help them uh, to succeed? People are in um, business for themselves. Your partners don't wake up in the morning thinking, oh, I want to sell Terminus. Um, they wake up in the morning thinking, I've got targets to hit, I've got kids to feed, and I've got my own objectives. And you happen to be part of that process, perhaps, uh, but you have to be relevant. So the first thing you have to do is get your own house in order um, and do not put Tim nice but dim uh, or your uh, latest uh, graduate hire into the channel. The channel is the hardest sales job there is bar none. Uh, but, you know, but at the end of a week, you might have had to wear 90 different hats and be referee to other people's children. Um, so make sure you understand why your partners are in business. Make sure that there is a good fit. Make sure before you start uh, working with them that you have an absolutely clear water pipe upfront agreement as to how you're going to work together. Uh, is their CEO the only person in their company who sells? Are they more technical than sales? Um, you know, what kind of relationship are you going to uh, establish with them? And make sure that you serve them uh, and treat them as your equal have a proper accountability process and have a cadence of regular communication. Uh, the problem is that most channel partners receive a call from a vendor and it's something along the lines of, Michael, what you got for me this month? Nothing great, I'll speak to you next month. And all they are is an interruption to their day. Um, every time you pick up the phone to your partners, you should deliver value. And they, the only currency that you have is influence and trust. So make sure you've earned that trust and don't uh, blow it by putting some eejit in there uh, who's uh, trying to uh, peddle product uh, or who uh, goes over their head. You know, they, they, these people have spent 10, 15 years establishing uh, customer relationships 
and then some channel manager who's green behind the hills uh, turns up and tries to go behind their back. And um, my, my pal, Zach Seltzer, I mentioned earlier, um, he says that the only way out of his network is in a box. And you need to have that mentality if you're running a channel. So um, I'll stop there. Yeah, my, um, my feedback when it comes to channel and, and partnerships, so it actually goes back to the ideal customer profile. So great partners are people or companies that have the same ideal customer profile as you. Because then essentially it's very easy for you to one refer each other business and it's a two-way relationship like marcus is saying you should never just use channel people and be like oh they're going to refer me business and don't do anything for them you have to help them as well and not even in a you know you scratch my back i scratch your back way in a genuinely helpful way but the second part is a network you actually create a network of people who are all together so I know, for example, both Cloud Task and, and Growth Genie, my current company, sell to sales and marketing leaders. So I've always tried to build a network of companies that sell to sales and marketing leaders. And that's not just necessarily service companies or software companies, anyone that does that um, we speak to. And then you build a network and you know, for example, like I know that, that Terminus sells to, to marketing leaders, right? And we sell to marketing leaders as well. So that would be a great partnership for us to have. So that's what you've got to think. Don't just think about your own ideal customer profile. Think about their ideal customer profile as well. Because if the two match, that's where you're going to have a lot of success. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to go. I've got a coaching call because um, we uh, seem to be overrunning. But I've put some channel resources uh, in the chat. Uh, so if anyone wants to uh, get hold of them, we've got a LinkedIn group. Um, there's an audio book and the book as well. Okay. Awesome. okay. All right. Thank you. I'm so sorry. And we love you for your brutality and <laughs> some tough love. Uh, it's it's actually very much needed. It's it's a uh, it's an honor to have you. No, yeah. no one brings me in for hugs and cuddles. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, um, our team at the back end actually loving everything that Marcus is saying. And you know, I'm I'm actually getting some feedback right at the back end. So yeah, thank you so much. Excellent. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we're gonna we're gonna continue with the rest of the panelists. And thank you so much, Marcus, for once again. Thank you. I I gotta run too. Um, I got a call coming up here. Well, that started four minutes ago, so <laughs> I gotta run too. <laughs> all right, all right, so, all right. not a problem. So cool. uh, appreciate it. Nice meeting you guys. See ya. Yes, nice yes. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. So right. uh, we actually do not have like much questions left, uh, and I think a few questions have already been answered by one of the uh, some of the panelists. So, uh, guys, any last thoughts? I mean, you know, uh, what would be your advice to the first-time entrepreneurs who had just started before the pandemic? And we just wrap up quickly. Yeah, it's we are we are definitely way over time. So I'll give my one quick thing. Um, I think uh, being intentional is more important than being than being brilliant. Is something that I've I've been learning a lot about. Is just be more intentional about every step, every reaction, comment. Be have more grace around it. That's way more important than having the best idea, being the most brilliant person in the room. Um, that will go a long way. Thank you, Michael. I think uh, Sangram and I should get a medal for staying till the end. But, uh, <laughs> 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 not till the end, five, five minutes, five minutes over. Um, yeah, for young budding entrepreneurs, I think it's, I think often people focus on the money and I think you have to focus on the impact. Are you going to have a huge impact on the people that you do business with? Because if you do, the money will follow naturally. So always think about the impact you're having. Because one, you're going to have happy, happy customers. And two, it's going to help you grow your business. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. And uh, this brings us to uh, the end of the session. Indeed, a value-packed session. Uh, there's a lot more that we could have covered. Unfortunately, we're limited by time here. Uh, Marcus and uh, Jason have already left us. So I, I hope you guys uh, loved the session. Once again, I'd like to thank Michael, Jason, Marcus, and Sangram for taking our time to be a part of this event. Um, and guys, uh, watching this, uh, this is not very tense. We have a lot more events lined up in section. The next webinar is on how to monetize and grow on Instagram. Uh, also, we have recently launched our studio, uh, uh, Design Hill Studio tool. It is a really good tool for everyone uh, who requires uh, creative assistance, be it a designer or non-designer. You can create beautiful designs, such as collateral presentation, everything that you can think of. So do check it out. Do check out the LinkedIn page as well. 
uh, and do let us know uh, the topics you want to want us to cover and the speakers you want us to bring to you. On that note, I'd like to say bye to everyone who joined us here today. Take care, guys, and stay safe. Bye, Singram. Bye, Michael. See you all. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye bye.